So in measuring the health of Australian music in 2010 and the Australian music industry, we're faced with a kaleidoscope of information and angles. Facts and viewpoints collide and contradict one another. It's almost impossible to get a reliable sounding. The truth is that the news is either all good nor all bad. Mainly, it's just different as, as we undergo enormous transformational changes in the way people release and consume music. To misquote Charles Dickens from A Tale of Two Cities, these are the best of times, these are the worst of times. We're all aware, of course, that the revenues from recorded music taken as a whole have been in decline globally for a number of years. As this slide graphically demonstrates, and it's a slide I've used before, the Australian recorded music industry enjoyed many years of virtually uninterrupted growth, spurred on firstly by the advent of the vinyl album as a legitimate art form in the 60s, then by the cassette, and finally by the CD format in the late 80s. Uh, Napster, iTunes, Kazaa, we're all familiar with the story, the declining physical CD market and the offsetting influence of the rapidly growing legitimate digital download market. But that doesn't tell the whole story because at the same time as we've seen the dropping off of recorded music revenues, we've also seen the exponential growth of the touring business, in, in particular festivals. The live scene has changed dramatically and remains strong. Older members of the audience, such as myself, can of course remember a time in the late 70s and early 80s when there was an explosion of rock pubs and bands. Um, for eight or ten dollars you could see any one of dozens of great acts playing within a vast network of live venues. Um, as as we, I think it was four dollars, when I first started in the business it was four dollars to see Richard Clapton at the Bondi Lifesaver. Can't get much for four bucks now can you? Um, as recently as ten years ago there was still a buzzing circuit of rock pubs around the country. Many, sadly, have closed, forced out of business by pokies, noise laws, licensing laws, and the rising cost of real estate. While the number of live music venues dwindles, in their place is a dazzling array of festivals. Today's music fan has access, access to all manner of digital entertainment, but the demand remains high for real experiences, shared experiences, which is why we find tens of thousands of people prepared to pay hundreds of dollars to see festivals such as Splendour in the Grass or Big Day Out. And these aren't shows or concerts as we used to know them, but rites of passage and rituals, and a great way to see a lot of bands in a short time. And meanwhile, the concert business has been going gangbusters. Kids are stumping up huge dollars to see global superstars like Pink and the Black Eyed Peas and Britney Spears, while well-heeled baby boomers, the same people who went to the rock pubs in the 70s, now prepared to pay $400 or more for a comfortable front row seat to the Eagles or Fleetwood Mac. And just as relevantly for this discussion, you've got Powderfinger's farewell tour snowballing into one of the biggest, highest grossing tours in Australian history. Why? Because a generation of people don't want to miss out on the, choice to, to, uh, on the chance to see this wonderful, wonderful band one last time. Like all great live music experiences, the experience of seeing Powderfinger for the last time will be cherished forever. It'll be indelibly stamped in the collective memory. The viability of touring for younger bands is obviously less rosy. Outside of the festival circuit, it seems there are fewer people interested in popping down to their local pub to see a couple of bands. But we'll return to the plight of developing artists later. So the growth of recorded music slows down. The live touring market enjoys several years of strong growth, at least for now. There are signs of a softening touring market, perhaps more so in the US than here. But we've seen cycles of boom and bust in touring before. And meanwhile, new and lucrative revenue streams open up as we see an increase in synchronisation and licensing and sponsorship. In Australia, through the work of PPCA, we've driven significant increases in the licence fees paid by businesses such as gyms, nightclubs and, and restaurants for the use of music. And the clear message is that the music business taken as a whole is not necessarily in trouble, but it is changing. 